All right. Did you bring your Bibles? Yes. Hey, <laughs> Hallelujah. David, are you ready? Yep. Who's that? Are you ready? Say this with me. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Say this with me. This is my Bible. I live by its truth. I walk in its light. I rest in its promises. I overcome by the faith produced by receiving this seed sown into my heart. Father, we thank you today in Jesus' name for your love, your grace, your mercy, and your truth that you've imparted to us through your word. We bless you today in Jesus' name. Change us by your word in Jesus' name. Somebody said... Praise the Lord. Open your Bibles up to Isaiah 55. I'm going to take a few minutes. I've given you a complete outline this morning. If you did not get an outline, raise your hand, and the ushers will make sure you get one. We have a couple over here. So if you need an outline of the service, keep your hands up, and the ushers will bring you one. Hallelujah. Um, I just want to speak for a few minutes, and then I'm inviting Julianne to come up and, and share uh, just her heart. And uh, actually, uh, I believe the ministry... That God has called us to. I believe public service is a ministry. Amen. And God calls men and women to serve Him in public service as a ministry to Him. Amen. And so I'm excited to come and share uh, this, her, her to be able to come and share her faith and her courage in launching into this new ministry in serving the Lord in her life. And uh, appreciate her husband Greg standing with her and the sacrifice, the choices they've made together as a team. Amen. Hallelujah. Isaiah 55, and if you're there, we're going to look at verses 6 through 9. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and let the unrighteous man and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the rain, as the, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Look at the cover of your outline, and what I will do is I'm going to hit some highlights in here, but I put this together so you could take it home. It is important for you as a believer and as a free person in America that you know your rights and you live acting on your rights. You must be engaged. The church can no longer be a spectator in social issues or in the world or in politics. You have to become engaged. You need to register. You need to vote. And you need to be involved. You get involved in serving in a campaign. Get involved in an issue of some kind. Stand up for something that you believe in. Amen. So in this, God says this, think about this, look, just walk through the cover of your outline with me. If we would think like God thinks, then we would live like God lives. That's really what the Lord said, that his way, he has thoughts and he has a way that he does things. So if I want to live like God, I have to think like he thinks and we would be in agreement with his word. But people want God's ways, but not God's thoughts. People ask the question all the time, why can't I keep my ways and thoughts and still live for God? You can, but you're self-deceived. Man always wants to do life on his own terms with God. Everybody in here has negotiated with God. Well, Lord, why do I have to change that? Why do I have to give up that? Because Christianity is a death and a resurrection to new life. Amen. Amen. So... Anyway, I, I can't get too caught up here. <laughs> so watch it. So we want to be friends with benefits without commitment when it comes to our walk with God. See, God has always had a voice in the earth to speak to the issues of the day, be it prophet, priest, or king. Today, our political candidate running for election try to speak to the issues that we face as a nation. They can say that they speak to the things that concern our peace, our prosperity, and our quality of life, both for today and for our future, yet most are driven by a personal agendas that are contrary to the moral fabric of our nation and the principles of God's word. 
That's why it's important that we, we, and, and in America, we've gotten where the only thing we care about is whether our checkbook has a balance. And so we voted for fiscal conservatives instead of moral conservatives. And then we wonder why our nation's going to hell in a handbasket. Because we've cared more about money than we did righteousness. God's voice has always spoken to the issues of the day and our future. The difference lies between the issues of man and the issues of God. God will always have a prophetic voice of His Word in the earth today through the mouth of His servants if they are bold enough to speak and we are willing to hear. So look inside your outline. I don't have time to read it, but John, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist came, and he came declaring, prepare the way of the Lord. So the question is, do we still need a voice like John's today? Absolutely. We still need to hear the voice of God. Is the cry for repentance and preparation still a valid call today? Yes, it is. Are we a people and a nation who have come to the place where we need no voice except our own? That's what people will tell you. Hey, we don't need to hear that. Preacher, be quiet. Church, stay within your four walls. Worship your God. Close yourself off from society. Let us make our own choices. I don't think so. I think the church needs to rise up. We've been the silent majority for way too long. Amen. Amen. See, elections take the spiritual temperature of our nation. What we vote for and what we vote against. What we define or redefine as our rights, our perceived definitions of freedom, regardless of the impact or imposition they place upon others, and the list seems to be unending. Look at all the issues that are being promoted today. There's a new one almost every week. But let me give you this. We've been told that there should be a separation from the voice of truth, that the church needs to be quiet, and that is not true. The state has always been separate from the church, but not the church from the state. Amen. Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to a Baptist church telling them that they had a right to speak, but that the government had no right to confine them. It wasn't saying separation of church and state. It was saying that the government has no right to be in the church. Are you with me? But people don't study, so they believe the lies that they're told. Which means, as the church, we do not have to forfeit our voice. We can speak to the issues and policies of our day, and the state may try, but it cannot silence our voice our, or our beliefs. Are you doing all right? Hopefully I'll get somebody fired up today. Think about it. The issue is the principle and not the person. Truth is not, a per, is not just personal. It is universal. It applies to everyone, everywhere, in every age and nation. Truth is more than a choice. Truth is a voice. And our, our world says, don't judge my choice. Accept me, my lifestyle, my choices. But don't judge, only love. Well, think about it. Love is not blind or void of the expression of the voice of truth. Loving somebody doesn't mean you don't say anything. Love does, has a voice and it declares that voice. I'm not, I am not to judge, but I am to be a voice. Truth is the judge. And the name of truth is Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the Life. Amen. In Matthew, John the Baptist said, there's one coming after me whose winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and he will separate the chaff from the wheat. There will be a day when there will be a judgment and a separation. And our goal is as a church is that everybody is headed to a day of accountability before God. And if we will not be a voice of truth, then we don't want people getting up there and surprised and not having had the opportunity to make a choice to avoid the judgment of God. Amen. So we have to be a voice. So sin affects a nation, a family, and a church. God is the only one who can define what is right in his presence. God was before man and man came forth from God to live in an unnatural way with unnatural views and still say that I worship God, the same God as you, is to change his nature to conform to yours. We cannot have a definition of truth and right that redefines His. And I'm not going to dive into this this morning too far, but we live in a day of identity uh, uh, change. Doing all right? 
where everything's being, we have all these identities that are coming up, and, and we're just, everything is, is identity neutral. Let me just help you. This is the key, and this is a lock. Okay? This key is made for this lock. This key goes in here, opens this lock. Okay? I don't care how long this key wants to identify as a lock, this key will never be a lock. This lock will never be a key. And these two were made for each other. There, 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 there's an intelligent design that's connected to purpose. Now, I have nothing against locks or keys. And, and I have locks of all different shapes and sizes and purposes. I have white locks, silver locks, uh, dull locks. I have a couple black locks. I have all races of locks in my family. Amen. And, and, and I can have keys that want to identify as locks and join themselves on a ring, but none of them have become a lock. They're still keys. But you're living in an age where we're, trying, where we're being told and our children are being told that it doesn't matter what you actually are as long as you identify it with something else. But what we're doing is, is that we have a definition of truth and right that redefines God's. And that's what's happening in our nation today. See, there's two types of teaching and goal. There's direct impact teaching, which is addressing current events in light of today's needs, opinions, and desires. And then there's long-term impact teaching, addressing current events in light of their impact on our future, not just our present, which is the liberal agenda. Which is why we've seen social engineering through our educational system. Which is why we're having all kinds of identity education being forced upon our children. Because if you can change a child, you can change a nation in just a few years. And that's what's happening. And then you have to decide. Some of you have children. You have grandchildren. Are you just going to let this world? Shape the identity of your children and have them be redefined thinking that they are something other than what they were and living in a confusion. Or are you going to stand up and be a voice of truth? Are you doing all right? So education is the front line in the cultural war of our day. Their goal is the social engineering of the youth of our nation, transforming their identity and value to take them in the direction they want them to go. You're living where there is a movement behind the scene that says we want this nation to go in this direction and we can't vote it in in one election. We can't vote it in in just a few years or change it. But if we, if we can get into the school, if we can get to the children, then in a few years we can begin to teach them when they are in preschool. Because if I can change their identity, what they identify with, you've heard me teach it to you, then I change their value system. And once you control identity and values, you now shape the direction that that person goes in. Every one of you, every decision you make depends upon your identity and what you value in life. And that determines your direction. Look at the next page of your outline. I'm going to just give you two points on here, and then on the back of your outline, there's some information in this issue. God has always spoken to issues. God's an issue God. He's a principle God. And we have to make sure that what we stand for doesn't violate the principles of God's Word. And I'm telling you, if just the church would rise up and vote... It's the church. I don't care what denomination. I don't care what background. I don't care about your theology. I don't care if you Ikemo Shiloh, give mine to Milo. I don't care anything about your doctrine, anything else. If we would just vote biblical truth and standards, we would take our nation back in one election. Come on, somebody ought to say something. Amen. Let me give you these three definite, and then I want Julianne to come up. What are politics? Politics is the science of government, the process of influencing and establishing policies to govern people, the total complex of relations between people and society. It is good, although often negative in our world today, but we still need it. Amen. 
It, it's not an unnecessary evil. It's a necessity to govern a populace of people. Democracy is this. Democracy is governed by the people. The rule of the majority. You do not live in a democracy. America is not a democracy. America is a republic. I pledge allegiance to the United States and to the republic for which it stands. The ruling of the majority which the supreme power is vested in the people and is exercised by them either directly or indirectly through a system of representation usually involving periodically held elections. Webster defined it as a non-discriminative source of rule, the absence of hereditary or arbitrary classes, distinction, class distinctions or privileges. One person said if America ever ceases to be more than 50% Christian, democracy will fail. Because if people are not right with God, government will not be right with God. Amen. Now let me give you this. What is a republic? A republic is government in which government in which supreme power is held by the people. How many get tired of hearing a politician tell you, well, uh, the, the American people want this, and they've never talked to me. I'll tell you what the American people want. You didn't tell me nothing. Amen. Think about it. But it's entitling them to vote. Elective officers and representatives with a chief of state, usually a president, never a monarch or a king. Now, I'll give you the difference between Republican and Democrat. These are just definitions, not platforms. Are you listening to me? Different. Republicans, this is the definition of a Republican. Keep government generally small. How many could say amen? amen? Allowing commerce to regulate and control itself. Leaving assets in the hand of the people. How many say that would be nice? How many would like to start a business, have everybody else pay for it but you? That's called government. Amen. Maintain a generally conservative moral value system for the country. Democrat, general definitions, not their platform. Providing sufficient government to meet the physical and social needs of the people. It is their responsibility, the government meaning, to meet the need, these needs rather than the leaving the assets with the people. Next, regulate commerce to keep balance and economic equality for the people. They think their job is to take the poor and lift them up and take the rich and bring them down. Thirdly, to provide legal rights and protection for all values, systems, and lifestyles. Rather than promote conservative moral opinion, they would promote all values and lifestyles. That's the difference. So when you say, I'm this or I'm that, those are the definitions. Are you listening to me? And so you have to decide, where am I going to go? You're going to make that choice. I believe the Bible tells us where we should go. Can you say amen? Yes. Amen. And so this morning, the last page gives you some issues that you can study on your own. What does the Bible say about politics? How to submit to authority? And on the last page, I just want to give you this. Can I submit and still address the issues? Can I be submitted to authority and still address issues? Amen. Take the responsibility to know your rights and to exercise and use your rights. If evil can be promoted through the system, so can good and righteousness. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Well, that's my introduction to Miss Julianne Benzel. Because that's why she's running. Because she stood up for something that is right and was reprimanded. And it brought her to a place where she had to make a choice. So I'm going to put your hands together and welcome Miss Julianne Benzel. She comes this morning. Well, good morning. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, we live in Rockland. We attend Destiny Christian Church, have been there for 30 years of our lives, um, embedded in and serving. But um, we've been traversing through lots of churches throughout California District 4. And the moment we walked in this building, when even just a few people were here and the worship band was practicing, there is a presence here. And we all know it's the Holy Spirit. Um, but even as a spirit-filled believer, I could sense it. And that's really special. So I'm sure you all know that what you have here is special, but I'm here today to affirm it. And I am so grateful, my husband and I, when I say I, it's definitely a we thing. We are so grateful to Pastor Don for um, his, his voice, his activism, his heart, um, and allowing us to just share our story and um, our vision with you this morning. 
And I would like to follow up on just a couple of things that he actually talked about. Um, you know, the state of California right now um, in the legislature is trying to pass legislation that says that our Holy Bible is hate speech. Is it time to rise? Yeah. Right? And um, this and this alone is my platform, the U.S. Constitution. So I am a lot of things. I am a wife. I'm a mother. Um, I'm an American historian. I'm a populist, which just means of the people. I am literally one of you. But most importantly is I am a warrior of the faith. And that is the only reason why I agreed to the Lord's idea of doing this. Um, probably like many of you, um, I started out, I mean, I, I'm, I'm no better, no worse. I've had a pretty sin-stained life until about 25 years of age. And then the Lord literally flipped my life and transformed me. And I'm not even that same person. And I'm sure many of you have that story. Um, but when you say yes to God, here's my life. You just never know. You think it's going to be fun and cool and a, a really great journey, right? But you just never know what he's going to do because he's so magnificent that what we conceive at the moment is not even but a speck of what he wants to do. So my husband and I have been married for 22 years. Um, we have um, been basically deeply embedded in our community. My husband was the football, high school football coach for 25 years, um, and I supported him. We're both hi uh, high school history teachers, again, very involved in our community. Um, we have five daughters, <laughs> um, football coach, five daughters, right? Again, the Lord is just hilarious, or at least he thinks he is. Um, so I always joke because my husband's very heavy on boys in his family, and I just prayed, Lord, please give me one daughter, please. And boy, did he multiply the righteous prayers of a woman, didn't he? <laughs> so five daughters. Um, our oldest is back at Liberty University in Virginia. She's our, our oldest, and then we have a little surprise baby, a four-year-old preschooler at home. So again, that's our life, and we really liked our life. Our girls play softball and volleyball. We're super into sports. And lo and behold, after 20 years, the Lord, what we thought was our journey, was our ministry, like, you know, pastor here, um, we thought, gosh, this is so great. We are living our best life, and, and things are good. And then on March 14, 2018, I don't know if you're going to show the video or not, but there's a two-minute video, um, and my life was, was turned upside down. Um, sure. You know what? Would that be okay just to give them a little background? Okay. So let me step aside, and this will give you a little glimpse. I'm a mother of five, I'm an American history teacher, and I'm fighting to restore who we truly are as a nation. On March 14, 2018, I was placed on leave by my public high school. Top of the hour, thousands of students are expected to walk out of their schools. Last month, Rockland High School in California placed history teacher Julianne Benzel on paid administrative leave after she had the gall to question whether the school would let its students walk out. To do what? Well, to protest abortion. Are you, you're not allowed to question the orthodoxy? You said hypothetically, would you support a pro-life walkout and they punished you for that? The nation vehemently came to my defense. I received phone calls, emails, and handwritten letters from Alaska, Maine, Florida, Texas, asking me to use my voice on a national level. It was overwhelming and relentless, and there is a definitive void in the 2020 narrative, that of the conservative female voice. I'm a mother of five living in suburban America. I am the middle class that politicians incessantly say that they are fighting for, and yet their policies rarely reflect it. Our family has been planted and invested in this community for the past two decades. I've analyzed, researched, and taught at the high school, community college, and university level for the past 20 years. The First Amendment is at stake here. If we lose the First Amendment, we have lost everything. It is a bedrock principle of our U.S. Constitution, and I'm going to ensure that it means something for all Americans, not just a few. When you love something, you serve it. I love my family, and I've served my family. I love my students, and I've served my students. And I love my country, 
and I'm ready to go serve my country. I am Julianne Benzel, and I am running for United States Congress. So that gives you a little backstory on, um, there's a couple of biblical analogies that we could invoke. Um, you know, a lot of people have said Esther. You know, I was just doing my laundry in my, in my uh, you know, house and the Lord said, pluck you out of obscurity. Um, David in the wilderness, we were just serving and doing our thing. And then he said, okay, come with me. Um, and then obviously there was, a, the last two years have been very painful. Um, my principal who put me on leave um, was supposed to be a friend of ours. And so the, sto the story of Joseph is also pertinent here because um, I could be bitter, but I'm not one at all, like 1%, not even my minuscule percent, um, because it took a while for me to get here but the Lord's like if you weren't placed on leave and if like Joseph's brothers if Joseph's brothers didn't throw him in the well he'd never get to the pal if you weren't placed on leave you'd never get into politics because I would never get, I'm an American historian I'm a minor in political science but never in my mind was I going to get actively involved in politics um, and so there's a lot of biblical references um, we believe because we're probably waging the most organic raw grassroots campaign possibly in the history of of the American Republic, um, and it's very much like you know um, Noah saying, "You want me to build a boat in the middle of a desert where it's never rained?" Um, this is very unprecedented, unprecedented, and unorthodox. Um, and we can talk particulars if you're interested. I am a very conservative Republican challenging our conservative Republican incumbent, and I just believe it's a new day, um, particularly because of the issues not only that Pastor alluded to here in the state of California, but in our nation. That's why I'm going federal, because the insidious and erroneous laws that are being passed here via our dictator, am I okay to say that he's a dictator? Okay. Um, uh, is, is <laughs> so refreshing. <laughs> um, and, and on that note too, in all sincerity, that's why I appreciate Pastor Don so much, is if I gave you the statistics of, of people who did not vote in the last election in California District 4, I think you would walk out here incredibly bereaved. And the statistic of Christians not voting not only bereaved me spiritually, because I've had conversations with people looking me in the face and saying, oh, I don't vote. You know, I love Jesus, pie in the sky, it's all going to end well anyway. This is just part of his plan. <laughs> and, then, and, then I, and then I stop and I say, okay, fine, take out Christianity and your spiritual life. You're an American citizen. You know how many people have died for your right to vote? Like I get really upset, <laughs> really upset. But in all sincerity, I do believe that if the churches will rise, if Christians will rise, we would not be in this place where we are. We are in an ideological civil war right now. We have, I mean, we are in a battle for the soul of our nation, and I am not a, um, um, an alarmist. I have the 400 years of American history to look at, and in all sincerity, I, my faith has never been under attack as it is today. And so I personally can no longer sit on the sidelines and say, well, somebody else is going to do it. Um, this was not my plan, but my husband and I have said, yes, Lord, yes. And so I guess my encouragement to you would be um, where, whatever avenue that you also feel like maybe, what can we do? I have so many people saying, what can I do? And as Pastor just alluded to also, um, you can get actively engaged in so many ways, but maybe even something as significant, might be seem small, but it's highly significant, is getting on your PTA board at at, at a school um, running I see a lot of people who are probably very prominent in the region um, the local school boards are highly highly significant when they are trying to tell our kindergartners that gender is fluid that's where we need Christian conservative school board members to say not on my watch no way um, and city politics is very important as well you can make significant change and you know if I thought I could make you know, this is not the state I grew up in I'm not sure how many native Californians are here but um, I'm a native Californian and this is not the state that I grew up in and I know that many people have left the state and believe you me my husband and I have thought many times where are we going Idaho Texas those are all sounding really great right now right um, however again just reiterating what pastor said we have to stand and fight 
this is, I'm not going, I'm going to spend the rest of my, the second half of my life ensuring that my children and my grandchildren can live out their faith in the greatest country that this world has ever seen. If we lose the First Amendment, there's no place to go. <laughs> I'm not saying America is perfect, okay? That's why I believe the framers very insightfully put toward a more perfect union, right? We're not perfect. We've never been perfect. Although I will say this, I believe that our country has rectified her wrongs better than any other country. We, we acknowledge when we've done things wrong. We apologize. And my goodness, we try to make amends where we can. Um, and, but, but this is a unique democratic republic. This is a unique document. And this thing is under assault as well. And so I, in, in all sincerity, believe that for such a time as this, and I'll give you one more historical kind of analogy, um, and then I don't know if we want to do questions or we can, however you want to do this. Um, we've had two great awakenings in our nation's history. So in the 1620s and 30s was the first great awakening, kind of this mass movement, um, kind of, again, it's just kind of like a, a, an awakening, a, an awareness of, of and, and a, um, an openness, if you will, to the things of God. And then if you fast forward 200 years in the 1820s and 30s, the second great awakening occurred and it was m a much larger, kind of expanded much further in our nation's history. And guess where we are 200 years later? 2020. And it's, as a historian, <laughs> that is utterly fascinating to me. And I am humbled beyond belief that the Lord would allow me to play even a small significant part in his glorious plan. Because I will tell you that we've been meeting in homes, we've been meeting around coffee tables, and not to overdo the history thing, but I really like history, um, is significant change occurs. I mean, you can see these big rallies, you know, and, and, and that's all very, very important. But significant change has always happened in U.S. history initially, then it, then it ripple effects into, but in, in coffee houses and in homes and, in, and, and people meeting in smaller groups. And we have, there is a pulse out there, I will tell you, that, and these are not just, you know, we have a lot more people, I guess you could say, on our side per se. This is not just conservative Christians, although I believe conservative Christians are going to be the impetus to all of this. But there are some very reasonable, as you call, you know, liberals or reasonable Democrats or reasonable any middle of the road, independent, whatever, however you identify, that are fed up with not, our politicians not listening to the people. And so there is this kind of swelling I think of it as a tide that is about ready to burst, and I believe 2020 is going to unfold all of this, and it's very, very exciting. Um, I believe the Lord, and you know California. I mean, California is just her own beast, right? She's always been. Um, but with all the dynamics of California coming into play, I just think it's going to be incredibly fascinating. And so I would ask you to just Carefully consider in prayer, Lord, how would you um, use me? How would you like me to be a part of clearly what is happening in our nation's history? Because I wouldn't want you to miss it as a Christian, whether you're politically inclined or not. I would still want you to see the hand of God move over this nation. Um, I will tell you that, um, that I'll leave you with one prophecy. Um, and it's from Australia, and so I really like when people talk into our nation. I, I follow one out of Israel as well, because there's a, there's a different perspective when you're not in the nation, right? You can just objectively look. And she said, I saw the Lion of Judah, the Lion, a Lion with his four paws over the United States. The Lion of Judah will reign again. Praise God. Good stuff. Amen. Yes. You know, there's a lot of uh, areas that we keep hearing that uh, uh, within 12 years, uh, the global climate change is going to, you know, we won't exist anymore. But it, it, it's not climate change. It's a social reformation, reformation change that's going to destroy our nation. And I don't think we have 12 years till we get to the end of that. You know, right? But it means we have to stand up and we have to do something about that. And uh, real quick, just before we uh, take some question and answers, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to prepare your offering. We're going to receive our offering right now. And uh, so if the ushers will come, 
just for the sake, because I want to take the last few moments and open it up to any questions and, uh, that you might have, and uh, then uh, we will uh, pray and uh, maybe even commission some folks. I, I think there's some people here that uh, have thought about being involved but have held back. And so how do I get involved? And so having Julianne here will be a blessing because you can actually ask her, how can I be involved? And uh, uh, how do I become an activist? How could I, you know, whether it's in her campaign or somebody else's, wherever you feel led, but to do something. Amen. Evil prevails when good people do nothing. Mm -hmm. And so we're past that place where we can be good and do nothing. It's time for us to uh, support. I'm kind of like Julianne. I'm born and raised here myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I believe in this place too much to just to give it up to evil people. Amen. Think about this. While you're preparing your offering, one of the greatest revivals that ever took place in America began at Azusa Street at the turn of the century. Out of California, not only came corruption, became one of the greatest moves of God that sent missionaries around the world. The largest missionary revival mm -hmm. came out of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. How many know it would be nice to see something other than what's come out of there now come out of there? <laughs> Amen. So God has had his hand on California in a lot of different ways. He's moved to this state. And uh, so this morning as you give, we thank you for being a part of the church, making ministry happen. Father, I thank you today for the faithfulness of your people. Lord, I thank you for all that you've given us. And Father, we thank you that we are able, as David said, we marvel that we are able to give back to you, seeing that everything we have comes from your hand. Father, receive the seed of your people sown today into your kingdom. Cause it to be multiplied back to them so they can continue to abound and increase and live generously, giving glory to your name. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. Go ahead, ushers. David, <coughs> if you guys will play that second uh, veterans clip for me while they receive that offering, please. And then we'll take some questions. There are sons and daughters, our mothers and fathers, our grandparents, neighbors, and friends. They served in a thousand different ways in places spanning the globe. Watching, waiting, and ready at a moment's notice to give what was asked of them. So now we pause to express our gratitude and love toward those who served. Each swore a sacred oath to protect, and each bravely stood in our place around the world, all so that we could stand secure in the land of the free. Words like sacrifice, honor, commitment, integrity, bravery, and courage hardly scratch the surface of our gratitude for their service. While our words fail against the enormity of expressing our thanks for all you've done, we still raise our voices and honor you in our hearts, which are filled with the deepest kind of gratitude. Yes. To all of you, we pause to say, God, bless you and thank you for your service amen would you give our veterans one more hand something that pastor just said also i want to follow up on is um the state of california um, you know, San Francisco is named after St. Francis mm -hmm. and Sacramento is the city of Sacrament. Sacrament yeah. There is a lot of um, historical, biblical, spiritual um, history here that is very, very important. So I do believe that California and then you also said something earlier about um, education that I want to follow up on. Ninety percent of kids attend public schools. 
90%. And I think that Christians are really kind and really gracious and actually very accommodating, almost maybe to a point and a fault, that um, the other side, those who are coming after our kids, they don't relent for even a moment. And so while we are serving in our communities and we're serving our families and we're giving to the needy and we're filling shoeboxes, they have an agenda that is so aggressive. Uh And all of a sudden we realize, as you, you, you alluded to it, that they've been working, working, working. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, kindergarten? You know, we're talking about that. So I want that statistic to just try to remain 90% of kids in this nation attend public schools. And I know probably for you, I know me, the the public schools, even though I was in them for 20 years, those are not the public schools that I personally grew up with and probably you. And so this is very, 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 unfortunately far too real. And it's a fight we have to have for our future. Absolutely, 100%, amen. How many know they say uh, that, that everything moves from the coast to the middle? And so California has influenced our nation in a lot of different ways with culture. What would happen if God just moved in California? How about if that swept across our nation? Mm-hmm. Amen. And so, so many other ways. But also, uh, you know, I, I get tired of people speaking so negatively about our state and only pointing out the negative. And this last week we saw an amazing community stand up and honor one of our fallen law enforcement and pe- Officer Brian Ishmael in that. And when you see community come together like that, how many know that's a good sign? Yeah. Amen. And people standing together. So, and on that so note, I'll, can yeah. I follow up? You sure you're can. saying so many good things I want to reinforce. Um, you know, I've had the Lord tell me many times, you know, just like when Jesus came out of Nazareth and people were saying, Nazareth, can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything <laughs> good come from California? Absolutely. And we are here to say, yes, it can. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Does anybody have a question you'd like to ask Julianne? Yes, sir. About politics or anything? Cecil, go ahead. If you don't act, you'll have to, some of you, whether it's your child or your grandchild, you're going to have your kids coming home and ask you what anal sex is. They're going to ask you about all kinds of different things from the sex education. So you either stand up against it or get ready to ask you the question at your dinner table. Amen. Somebody else had a a hand? Anybody else have? Tony? Amen. Thank you, sir. Um, there, if uh, this might seem a little bit silly, but it's super easy, and if you don't have a lot of time, um, in all sincerity, there are some great Christian YouTube short videos that will kind of give you an abridged edition of where we've come as a nation. And so I would, um, I'm trying to think of this precise wording to put it, but something along the lines of um, our Christian heritage or our Christian nation. Um, you will um, probably come up with more resources than you even want, but it's something that you can digest and manage quickly to get a 
very, you know, overview glimpse. So our heritage or our Christian heritage, yeah. There's a lot of good projects yeah. out there that are. You, you can go to Wall Builders and David Barton, and uh, you'll get bombarded. David Barton is a historian on America and uh, our founding fathers and that, and so tremendous resources. By you can just Google David Barton or, or Wall Builders, and uh, saw a couple of the hands. Uh, okay, uh, but yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you can go to the Heritage yeah. Foundation, too, and, the, and they have uh, great resources there. And thank you for serving on the school yeah. board. <laughs> Over here, uh, Peter. Right, which we don't want to do, okay? And that's why we do have a homeless crisis is because our glorious governor is giving them $70 a month if you're homeless. So, you know, it's like a magnet. Why wouldn't you come to California with this glorious weather and want to be a homeless person when you can have at least $70 a month plus government aid, right? One thing that, I'm in, in all sincerity, I am running for a federal position, um, but I will do everything that I can to use the clout and power of the office. And so there's this example out of the city of Houston. And what they did is they took federal, state, and local leaders and then they took community leaders, they took pastors, they took charities, private businesses, and they put them all in a room together and said, how can we fix our homeless crisis? Because it was pretty bad in Houston. And they have decreased over 50% by, again, I'm going to use the word collaboration, which we don't see a lot in government, unfortunately. But that would be my strategy, is that I, we need to, for, there's, there's so many issues that are not partisan. We're fighting for our faith, but there are so many issues that concern us and should concern us. But they're not partisan issues. Whoops. And homelessness, we should all be concerned about. And so I, that, as, as your representative, that's what I would do is use the clout and power of the office because you can't do anything, you know, legislatively for California's homeless price crisis because it's a state issue. Um, I would say sign hashtag recall Newsom. Can you tell I don't like him? <laughs> I should have brought petitions today. You're out of here. Amen. Um, <laughs> Let me just say this real quick on this area to understand. The reason it doesn't change is because California has voted in uh, politicians that create dependence. And subsidies and entitlements create dependence that get recycled votes. They're not concerned about fixing problems. They're concerned about generating dependence. Mm -hmm. And they want people who will vote a thank you without finding an answer. Nothing will ever change in government until the people get tired of paying for government programs. Every program that comes up, Medicare for all, $52 trillion. A trillion is $1,000 billion. $52,000 billion. You can't even wrap your brain around that. But the way we're going to pay for that is that it's not with the money that they have. The economy is up. Taxes are up. Income tax is coming in. More revenue is coming into the government without them raising it in the tax. There's no fiscal accountability. They don't pass balanced budgets. And until the people say, before you tax me again, balance your stinking checkbook. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And show me what you're doing with the money that you have and begin to... There's more than enough problem, I mean money, to solve the problems that we have. We get every homeless person off the street. We could have uh, centers and places for them. But the problem is, is that if you do that, you're taking away dependence and votes mm -hmm. and doing that. Uh, two more questions. Michael? Mm -hmm. So, what is your contact information? How do we help? 
Um, thank you for asking. Um, again, Pastor John has been very gracious. We do have information, and my husband will, will and I will be out there afterward. Um, we have some flyers. We have some cards. Um, you know, we um, definitely could use any help that you are willing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I reemphasize one you other thing you just said? Right <laughs> um, you know, I'm I, I'm with George Washington in that I, you know, he didn't like political parties at our nation's inception because they're divisive and you know it's the us versus them. Um, I I'm kind of in that frame, but I will tell you that I have read the 300-page document of the Republican National Com uh, uh, um, uh, platform and the Democratic one. And what we never saw before within the last couple years, the Democratic platform has taken God out of uh -huh. their, their document. Uh -huh. And so I'm not saying that the Republican Party is perfect. I'm not saying they always have the best ideas, um, all of that. But as a Christian, you said vote biblically. When one party literally takes God out of their party platform, what is the option? <laughs> what and they is take the, the American flag off of their debate stages. Exactly. So there has yeah. not been an American flag on the debate stage for the Democratic candidates in either one. So uh, just interesting. And when they talk about democracy and not republic, when they talk about a majority, when they talk about giving majority rule and take away the individual rights of the states through the Electoral College, they're tearing down the moral fabric of our nation because the electoral college is set up that every state would have a voice the same way every vote has a voice every state has a voice when it comes to our presidential election and if you just go strictly by the majority winning the popular vote you listen to me then you take away the voice of every nation so you're representing the borders and, ta and not representing the central heart of our nation or the or other people. Two more questions. Uh, uh, Dennis, you had your hand up for a second. Uh, do you know anything about the uh, state of uh, New California? That movement? Jefferson? Is that a legitimate movement? Mm -hmm. And if so, when might that happen? Are you looking into being part of that? Sure, I'll govern that. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> um, in all sincerity. We've got about an hour and a half, we'll cover that. <laughs> yeah. In all sincerity, I, um, I mean, obviously the state of Jefferson has been in you know, uh, as, a, as a thought and in progression for a very long time. But because Californians are so fed up, but they don't want to leave, there is significant money, there's significant momentum behind it. I feel like we missed an opportunity the last ballot because somebody came along and tried to carve in six different, you know, six di California into six different states, um, which is, again, kind of silly. But I do think that this northern part of California, that's Jefferson, um, the momentum is there. I think the funding is there. I think it just is a matter of convincing um, the entire state um, because a lot of what Jefferson would entail, of course, you know, Sacramento and Los Angeles, San Francisco, they don't want to get rid of it because it's a glorious part of the state. We live in the best part of the state. So I, I, I think there, I have a nominal uh, glimpse of hope. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, there, there, there's a lot to that to make that happen. It, it'd be, in my opinion on that, it'd be better if we consolidated just to take back the one state we have. And, and work with a collective effort just to rise up and mm -hmm. say no and work with that. There, there would be a, a we could get uh, some quicker results that way. Agreed. Steve, yeah, your hand up and then. Amen. Correct. Thank you, sir. That has got to be somehow or other a part of our thinking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and our efforts mm -hmm. in terms of working at restoring mm -hmm. what was and is still the greatest mission. 
Amen. Amen. Well, the Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. It's just time we did that again, that we got back our boldness mm-hmm. in that. And, uh, you know, I was, heard a thought this morning. I was just thinking about it, but it was Robert Morris was, I like listening to him on Sunday mornings. I'm shaving and that, but he had a great preacher. Um, but he was making a statement about our adversary being a roaring lion. And he's talking about the way and that lions are never on the road. They're always in the bushes on the side of the road mm-hmm. looking for a prey. Mm-hmm. And I forget, it was at Kruger National Park in South Africa traveling with our friend James Stewart. And I'm all excited. I'm, I'm sitting with my butt out the window and I'm taking a picture of this rhino across the top of the truck. And he goes, get back in here. You can't do that. And I said, why? Because he said the lions lay in the grass on the side. And they wait for somebody like you to stick their butt out the window. <laughs> and they come up and they get you. They said, get back in the truck. And uh, story of my life, actually, that's the way it goes. <laughs> but uh, we keep thinking that the enemy's going to be walking plainly down the middle of the road. Mm-hmm. And when you watch it, listen, with the li- you have an adversary as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yeah. And so when you watch... National Geographic or Discovery Channel. Lions don't just come out in the middle of the gazelles walking up. Hey, guys, I'm here. (laughs) They're sneaking up, and that's where we've missed it, the subtlety of the enemy Mm -hmm. to come behind that's creeping in there. And then we give up, and we buy into the lie that that the church, you can be loving, but you always speak in love. And you, and you never give up your voice for truth. You, we do not have to give up our voice for truth. We have to find, the church has to get its backbone back and stand up for truth and be a voice. You can say it lovingly. I lovingly disagree with you and I have the right to disagree and I do not have to be silent. You can be as bold. Jesus said this, I will build my church. Listen, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, which meant that hell would come against it, but it would not prevail. So we need to understand there will always be an opposition coming, but we're supposed to stand in truth. Ray, last question. Thank you. You know, we have a dear friend, Lou Sheldon, who stood up in the 80s against the homosexual agenda and was run out of churches for standing up. And uh, Kathy and I have worked with him. Kathy served with him and was on staff with him and stuff. And Lou has lobbied in America standing up for tradition, the Traditional Values Coalition. But it was sad that churches refused to take a stand and now churches are telling that they that their bible is now hate speech because they always thought oh it'll never go that far Mm -hmm. that's a lie it'll never go that far Mm -hmm. the lie of the devil no we just want no it'll never go it doesn't matter perversion no matter what it is and whether it's sexual or any type of version is never satisfied it's an unquenchable appetite that is always consumes and goes further amanda last one and we'll go Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so two things. One is the districts are going to change, but not for 2020. So the, the, the everything's still in place for 2020. And then they will be. This is a very huge district. It goes from Te- Tahoe and Truckee all the way down through El Dorado and Placer County, all the way down through um, 49, Jackson, Ione, Calaveras, Yosemite, south of Yosemite, Kings Canyon. So to your point, yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Tual- I was in Mariposa a couple of days ago. It's an 
enormously vast district. So in the next election, 2024, um, that we're actually probably for congressional, it might be ready by 2022, um, it will be different. And then um, Valerie, is she a conservative Christian? I'll support her. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. Um, there, I will say also, um, I don't do identity politics by any means, um, but there is kind of a new day, if you will, that, you know, again, I think a lot of conservative women, I know I never, this was never on my radar. <laughs> and I know that, you know, politics can be really di divisive and, and, you know, um, women don't like divisiveness that much. Most most of us don't. Um, so it's not an area where conservative women have really gotten involved. They've, they're really high in level businesses, what have you. But to your point, um, there is, I, I want you all to just be watching for this. There, all across the country. I am not alone, and I am certainly not the only voice. There are conservative women standing up for our nation's values. So be on the lookout for them. Amen. Let me just say this as we pray over you this morning. Here's a mom, a teacher, and just an average person who just said, I can no longer be on the sidelines. I have to be involved. And that's really what I ask you is that Really just ask God, how should I be involved? What should I do? How, how, how is, I can't just sit back and complain and make a Facebook post of a meme. Those are fun, though, right? They are fun. <laughs> Especially the ones about AOC. Anyway. I'm hoping, by the way, you've said her twice now, so I'm, gonna just, I'm just following your lead. That's um, so awesome. <laughs> um, I am hoping to be the, well, I am the antithesis of her. That's right. Um, period. But, you know, she's from New York. I'm from California. And I am praying that the Lord gives me an opportunity to say this, and not in an um, egregious way, because I don't want to disparage anybody personally, but the little sweetie would not have passed my class with her lack of knowledge of our democratic republic. Mm -hmm. And so she has had her voice for far too long and dictated too much of the narrative, and it's time that the West Coast has a voice. Amen. <laughs> all right. If she can be loud, we can be loud. That's all I got to say. And so if all, all it takes is brown hair and red lipstick, and you can say anything you want. Anyway, move on. Oh, Pastor, I know. Elvis has left the building. All right. Stand with me this morning. Greg, come on up here, buddy. Join hands with somebody next to you. You don't have to reach all the way across the aisle, but if somebody next to you, you can. Father, today we just come and we humble ourselves before you because that's what you tell us to do. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, if we would repent and turn from our sins, then you would hear from heaven and you would heal our land. So, Father, today we repent of apathy. We repent of inaction. We repent of excuse and reasons to observe without participation, to criticize without involvement. And, Father, today we ask that by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to each and every one of us. And Lord, I pray for your people. We're not promoting agendas or platforms. We just want to promote truth. Yes. So Father, I pray that your people would have one thing. They would have a hunger and an appetite to know the truth. Jesus, you said that if we would continue in your word, that we would know the truth and the truth would set us free. And we thank you that you are the truth. And truth is more than just words on a printed page. You are the truth. And your desire is to live and to abide in each and every one of us. And when you, when you live in us, truth abides within. And so, Father, maybe today we need to repent of violating the truth that abides in us by voting for things that violate the convictions and the truth of your word. So, Father, today we take a stand that we will be a people who will no longer vote for ease but we will vote for truth. So, Father, I thank you that not only will you have your hand upon Julianne as she moves forward and Greg as they enter through this battle together over these next 
almost 11 months, Father, but that, Father, you would bring a support team around them to strengthen them, people who would pray for them, give towards this campaign and support them in whatever way they can, become workers. Lord, that you would just use this and raise up a voice. And Father, that by that, she would be an inspiration and encouragement to just every person. As she said, one of the populace, not one of the politicians, but a person of the populace, of the people who just said, it's time for me to no longer be on the sidelines, but to do something. So, Father, today I pray your anointing over your people, an anointing for clarity, for truth, for understanding, and then to rise up and act with purpose. And I bless them today in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. To all of our veterans, I again say thank you so much. We love you. We honor you. We respect you. Everybody have a blessed day. If you have children.